You're watching Cyrus TV, everybody. Our lunchtime coverage continues on this, the last day of Cyrus. And right now, we're going to talk about the securities market infrastructure space across Africa. And to do that, we have a panel of experts. Let me introduce you to them. Narina is closest to me. She's from Ned Bank Capital. Cyril is a partner and CIO at Enco Capital. Uh, Leila is from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. She's a director of post trade services there. And Sunil is the chief executive of the Stock Exchange of the Mauritius, and he is the president of the African Securities Exchanges Association. So thanks so much for coming. You're all looking very dapper. I want to start with you, Sunil, first of all. Just give us the big picture of what's happening in the infrastructure space across Africa. Well, uh, basically within the stock exchange space, I think there's a lot happening because, as you're aware, Africa is gaining a lot of interest from investors across the world. Mm -hmm. We're see seeing a shift in asset allocation from the Western countries to frontier markets, and Africa is part of the frontier market space. And, and because there's a lot of interest, I think African exchanges are tuning up mm -hmm. to that uh, expectations of international investors. So there's been a lot of uh, up upgrade in terms of technology. Most of the African exchanges have gone to electronic trading over the last five years. They moved away from historically manual trading systems to electronic trading systems. They've also set up uh, electronic uh, uh, clearing and settlement system and align those uh, systems with international norms in terms of uh, settlement cycles. Many a African exchanges today operate on a T plus three mm -hmm. uh, settlement cycle mm -hmm. basis and ensures what we call strict delivery versus payment in terms of settlement. And uh, on an individual basis, many exchanges are doing uh, uh, you know, other things. For example, in Mauritius, we're trying to internationalize our, uh, internationalize our stock exchange platform. Historically, we have been an e equity-centric domestic exchange, and now we feel that because Mauritius is a small country, because Mauritius is, is limited in terms of space, in terms of uh, potential listings, mm -hmm. so we want to leverage off the attractiveness of Mauritius as a service platform for Africa to reach out to uh, international issuers. So therefore, in that context, in terms of infrastructure, we've come up with a multi-currency listing, trading and settlement platform. We can list, trade and sell products in international currencies, US dollar, mm -hmm. uh, Euro, GBP, and South African rand. So our whole objective is to grow our market and internationalize it. So to your right, you've got three practitioners f across South Africa. Tell us about some of your experiences in these markets. I think one of the things that I find quite interesting in terms of the African opportunity is that a lot of people focus on the great growth potential that the African continent offers, but there's not as many investment opportunities that actually can capitalize on that growth. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why the development of the securities market infrastructure is so incredibly important. And it covers the entire spectrum from what regulations need to be put in place, um, what financial services providers need to be in place, um, all the way through to the, the final investor, and that investor is not just the international investor, but also very much the African investor. Less than, it's estimated that less than 1% of people on the African continent actually are investors in the stock market. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about Africa being an unbanked continent, it's even more an uninvested continent. Mm -hmm. So there's great growth opportunity also for financial services providers in this space. But in order to facilitate, it's so important that we actually have have the standardized regulations and platforms through which a lot of this facilitation can take place. Yeah, I think I quite agree with uh, what uh, Narita just said. Um, really, what we see so, so certainly from the perspective of uh, an investor in, these, uh, in the African market is that the biggest challenge that we face is just the availability of uh, opportunity to invest in. You know? um, we think that there is really an imbalance between the supply and demand of mm -hmm. uh, of uh, available uh, assets, so we need to really broaden uh, the universe, uh, investable universe of uh, of stocks and securities that uh, that we can invest in. Obviously, uh, we think the market infrastructure comes second because obviously, first of all, people want to see that there are opportunities, uh, and then obviously they want to make sure that you know they can properly uh, invest in a, in a sort of uh, efficient and and cost-effective way. And there, 
you know, really the, the key challenge that we're facing in terms of uh, related to the market infrastructure. The first one uh, is on the custody side. Uh, the cost of custody is quite uh, high uh, across uh, the African market, especially the sort of more frontier markets sort of north of, uh, of South Africa. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed because uh, having uh, cost efficient uh, custody is important for foreign investors. The second um, important issue is also uh, access to information. Uh, that, that's also uh, a bit of a challenge, especially from foreign investors. So we need to make sure that uh, there's more standardization in terms of uh, the, the way and the, the, the quality of the information that gets disseminated to the investor community. And then I would say the, the, the last one, which is also related to the first one, is essentially transaction cost. If you look at brokerage cost uh, on this market, they're still quite, uh, uh, quite high. You know, for example, I mean, uh, uh, you still can pay uh, in some market 3% you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to buy a security. So that, that's quite high by international standards. See that? Uh, result in uh, less liquidity on these markets. Let's go down there because yes. that's uh, a great absolutely. question for you to come in. Uh, absolutely, and, and really I think the, the supply and demand point that you raised is a very vital point. The exchange is very much about exchanging supply for demand and there is enormous demand on the continent. What we see is um, infrastructure demand across the country, across the all countries growing tremendously. We, the World Bank has, has identified that 93 billion will be required for investment in infrastructure. There's also on the supply side, tremendous growth intra-Africa. We're seeing consumption growth and therefore salaries increasing tremendously and we think that there's an untapped market market, in the informal market, as well as in the retail market. Um, within intra-Africa uh, engagement and collaboration, we are seeing a lot of collaboration between like-minded or geographically centered countries. Mm -hmm. For example, the East African uh, cross-listings harmonization that um, recently uh, came about. There's also a West African central exchange infrastructure. The SADC countries have worked very hard to try and harmonize regulation and exchange um, uh, listings requirements. From a, a JSC perspective, we recently launched a uh, Zambian grain contract, which really does very well to create flows between the countries because futures are listed in US dollars on the exchange and the spot is settled in the Zambian currency. So I think personally the commodities and infrastructure boom and the growth across the conti continent is bodes very well for the development of infra infrastructure in the African continent. Mm -hmm. What would you say to, I mean we've had a lot of recent press, uh, a lot of um, global banks that have exited uh, certain parts of the world because they say, you know, the cost, uh, bring up the cost of, you know, bring up return on investment as well. What would you say to people, financial institutions outside Africa, looking at Africa now as to what kinds of time frame that they need to do and the kinds of key lessons that they probably don't know now <laughs> that they've got to learn? I think the first thing they need to do is to take off their, their own glasses, their Western glasses, if I may put it that way. I think the chicken egg situation that we've got in Africa in terms of developing it, at the same time wanting the already developed market is where a lot of the, the contradiction comes from. I think investors wanting to engage with Africa need to acknowledge the unique criteria in Africa, um, look at it not just from a traditional first world market perspective, but acknowledge that why they are in Africa is exactly some of the differences from their own market and actually embrace that and not want a market that looks too much like their own mm -hmm. because then they'll actually lose the diversity opportunity that they've got there. Mm -hmm. And probably one of the biggest pair of glasses that I think they need to take off is the glasses of the US dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, Africa as a continent is, is really almost held hostage by the US dollar and by the US Fed. We saw just again last mm -hmm. night, you know, the whole world watches what Ben Bernanke has to say, even though it's actually got precious little to do with us here on or it should have very little to do with mm -hmm. us but I think it, it, it's indicative of the extent to which it is being affected by exogenous events things beyond our control and investors wanting to engage with Africa I think need to really focus on what is unique and special about Africa and not come with um, almost their first world market narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, just to build on Irina's point, I think you know now is the time to uh, invest in Africa. I mean, Africa's the prospects certainly in Africa have never been uh, 
uh, as bright, you know. And I think you know what is important about the African story is that now it goes beyond the mining. Obviously, there's been the, the African growth story has always been uh, a story of a boom and bust depending on the mining cycle. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting today is that you've uh, we've got other fundamental driver of the African growth, the emergence of a middle class, uh, increased investment in infrastructure. Uh, tremendous potential in agriculture, um, uh, the, the youth of the population. So what we see and how it translates, uh, it translates obviously in, in sector like banks into uh, sort of double digit growth. I mean, most banks in Africa are experiencing, you know, growth in excess of 20%, you know, mm -hmm. certainly in, uh, in sub the, across sub-Saharan Africa. The return on equity, if you look at the return on equity of uh, banks in Africa, they're much higher. I mean, they, they, they're sort of well above the kind of return that you see in uh, the, the developed world. And also if you look at just the, the sort of um, banking system generally, um, if you look at the countries uh, as a whole, they, they're a lot less in debt. So obviously the, the banks are a lot less at risk than they are in, uh, in, in, in Europe. So uh, really you're looking at, um, at a, a fantastic uh, investment opportunity over the next uh, few years. Mm -hmm. We're actually at a wonderful point of inflection in our cycle because if we look at the growth rates that the developed market are experiencing, minus 0.5% in Europe, we're seeing 2.75% uh, in uh, America, 3.7% globally, Africa's offering 6% growth. And most of those developed worlds, together with the recently announced Ben Bernanke, very cheap money that's mm -hmm. getting flooded into the economy um, needs a home in order to find good returns. And what we are seeing is much more macroeconomic stability, much more political certainty, and on a relative scale, a lot more trust and credibility, um, which is a wonderful time for Africa to take up its rightful space in the world. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts from you, Sunil. Well, basically I think uh, mm -hmm. the difficulty about talking the last is that mo most of what has to be said has been said. I think one issue that I would like to, one message I have to convey to you know institutions mm -hmm. operating on a global scale is uh, come to Africa because early move advantages is always very mm -hmm. important when you're coming into a new space. Uh, I think Africa is largely untapped mm -hmm. in terms of the potential that it represents in different fields of activity within the financial services sector, be it in terms of fund management investments, be it in terms of brokerage securities. I think what we, we should try to do in terms of African exchanges and other operators in Africa is to create the space for international players to connect mm -hmm. to our, our countries in a cost efficient, simple way, mm -hmm. because we are living in an environment where there is an, an international crisis that is still going on. And I don't think it will be easy for big firms to move to Africa, mm -hmm. open businesses, because the, s the scale is not there. Mm -hmm. But I think the business opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. So if we can provide to these institutions an easy, cost-efficient, and simple way to access to our market, this will make a big difference to us, because we'll be able to attract global mm -hmm. order flows, increase liquidity, and then attract more issuers to come. So, you know, it's a, it's a virtuous circle okay. of events that can help us to well, achieve that. Well, we've got to leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us. I hope you've had a great time in Dubai. Enjoy the rest of your time here. Thanks for giving us Thank your you. time here Thank on you. Cybers TV.